Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Chechi Galanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the educational platform of the World Stroke Organization, which provides free educational material for healthcare professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that we are hosting another educational activity today on the topic of ICH management with exceptional speakers who will be sharing their expertise on the topic. Now, before we go ahead and get started with the introductions and introducing also today's moderator, a few words on our housekeeping rules as per usual. We, of course, invite you to ask your questions, uh, but we kindly um, ask you to use the Q&A box for those, which appears in your Zoom control panel. You can also, of course, use the chat box to say hi or where you're joining us from or leave your feedback. Um, a note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording link will be made available with all of you uh, shortly after the webinar. It will be placed on the World Stroke Academy site and our YouTube channel. And uh, at the end of the webinar, there will be an evaluation survey popping up on your screen. So we kindly ask you to share your feedback with us, which is very important to understand for upcoming activities, what it is you would like to see, but also to know what your thoughts were on today's webinar. Now, before introducing today's moderator, I will leave the floor to World Stroke Academy's Editor-in-Chief, Professor and Dr. Gustavo Sapostnik. The floor is yours. Thank you, Laura, and uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure again to, to be with you and offer this opportunity to have outstanding expert speakers. So the reason of I'd like to bring to your attention is twofold. Number one is all the speakers receive no compensation, so they are contributing and giving you part of their expertise uh, uh, for free, number one. Number two is the only thing that we are asking in return is to fulfill the survey at the end. The WSA, it, it's, uh, it's putting a lot of effort on behalf of the WSO to make this happen, all for you. The only thing in return that we are asking is please complete the surveys because this is the only way for us to improve. So thank you very much and thank you all the speakers, Laura, and again, uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you very much for this note. And now without further ado, let me introduce today's moderator, Professor Dr. Anita Arsowska. She is Professor of Neurology at the University of San Cyril and Methodius in Skopje, North Macedonia, but she's also the Associate Commissioning Editor at the World Stroke Academy. Anita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, dear colleagues, welcome to the WSA ICH webinar where we have extraordinary speakers. Our first speaker is Professor Gisbel Sampaio Silva, Professor of Neurology at the Federal University of Sao Paulo and Head of Neurology Clinical Research at the Albert Einstein Hospital in Brazil. Her talk is starting or resuming anticoagulation. Dear Giselle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anita. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. I'm gonna share my screen. And please let me know if it is working for all of you. Perfectly. Thank you, Anita. So we are gonna discuss this difficult topic that is starting or resuming anticoagulation after ICH. So those are my disclosures, nothing specifically related to this presentation. So it's important for us to know that atrial fibrillation, one of the most important reasons for a neurologist or for a clinician to anticoagulate a patient is very common. We have data that about one fourth of the individuals over four years old will develop AFib in uh, their lifetime. And we know that AFib increases fivefold uh, the risk of stroke. So we have here numbers from Latin America, and you can see that the pre prevalence um, gets higher as, as uh, the population is getting older. Well, the good news is that we have good medications for preventing uh, ischemic stroke and uh, systemic emboli in patients with the AFib. So we have data from the Garfield uh, AF registry that actually more and more the patients are receiving anticoagulation. And we are seeing that from 2000, 
2010 to 2015, there is actually an increase of the use of direct anticoagulants and a decrease, uh, an increase in the use of direct anticoagulants, a decrease in the use uh, of warfarin. And what's the good uh, news? So patients are more and more getting something. But uh, with solutions, we have uh, new problems. So we have data from uh, the Medicare Part D beneficiaries showing that the total use of anticoagulation is increasing. So for us, uh, knowing that AFib is one of the most important causes of stroke, it's a good news. The use of direct or oral anticoagulation is also increasing, which is also good because such medications are safer than warfarin. We have a decrease in the use of warfarin, but it's important for us to know that actually uh, those medications, they are safer, but they also have a, a come with a risk of uh, intracranial bleeding. So around 4 to 6% of patients treated with factor 10A inhibitors, so the most uh, used drugs as oral direct oral anticoagulants, like hibaroxaban, apixaban, or edoxaban, uh, they will develop some bleeding. And from this bleeding, so 9% uh, will be intracranial bleeding. And the bad news is that mortality is really high. So we have data that mortality for patients using uh, direct or, or anticoagulants who have an intracranial bleeding can go from 11 to up to uh, 20%, depending on the drug used. If we go to the pivotal trials, Aristotle and in Rocket AF, you can see that this uh, mortality rate is even higher, so around 40%. When you go to real world data evidence, uh, so this uh, mortality rate is a little bit lower, probably telling us that we are knowing how to choose the patients to receive anticoagulant and the timing to give this anticoagulant, but still uh, that's something that we cannot ignore, so about more than 20%. So when we talk about ICH and you're gonna uh, be listening uh, to Stefan Schwab and Claude Hanfield, it's very important for us for interparenchymal tolls hemorrhage for us to think what caused the hemorrhage. So just like we have uh, for acute ischemic stroke, the toast classification. So there are some proposals in classifying the etiology of the ICA. So this is one that we use in our service, the smash U described by Meritoja showing that not only uh, the frequencies are different, but also patients uh, with etiology of uh, ICH caused by systemic causes and medications, they have a very high mortality. So much different than patients that have an ICH due to an AVM or other reasons. So this is um, what the distribution is in our service, a public health service in Brazil, saying that we have at least 15 to 20% of the patients admitted with ICH that are related to medication use. So the important thing is for us to answer two different questions. So in the acute phase, how does the risk of further bleeding, hematoma expansion, compare with the short-term risk of thromboembolism? And in the chronic phase, how does the risk of recurrent hemorrhage compare with the excess risk of thromboembolism if the patient does not resume anticoagulation therapy? We do know and you've learned a lot that you have you know, several markers uh, of anticoagulate of the risk of hematoma expansion in the acute phase, including the first described sign, the spot sign. But even in the CT without contrast, we have signs like the Swear sign, the island sign, mostly hypodensity inside the hyperdense uh, hematoma, showing us that uh, that hematoma is not stable. So when we are going to decide if we're going to restart or not anticoagulation, uh, we have to weigh things like uh, is the, the hematoma and hypertensive hematoma? Does the patient has a previous stroke? Uh, am I dealing with a patient with valve prosthesis? The shots mask score is very high. Those are all factors that are in favor of restarting anticoagulation. And there are some factors that also uh, make us think about not restarting it, like the patient having amyloid angiopathy, a lot of microhemorrhages, uh, being primary prevention or low shots mask score. So what we have as data to support our decisions. So this is a very important um, study published in Germany. So Dr. Stefan Schwab participated on it, looking at a bundle of care of patients uh, with uh, ICH. So actually uh, the authors evaluated um, 19 centers in Germany and evaluated what would be like the effect of reversing anticoagulation in patients who have ICH due to anticoagulants, 
treating blood pressure acutely, and resuming anticoagulation in patients who have an indication for anticoagulation. So they showed very important results showing that we have to be quick in ICH reversal. So the INR has to be reversed to less than 1.3. And here we have data for patients treated with VKA. Uh, and one other important thing was that, so resuming anticoagulation, they use propensity score match. It was very, very protective or more than 70% of the patients having a second ischemic stroke or a systemic emboli. So we are more and more understanding that patients with ICH, uh, they are at risk for thromboembolic event as well. So this is a very interesting study conducted by data, Dr. Eva Rocha, who was, uh, worked with me in the, her doctoral thesis, and she performed transcranial Doppler in the acute phase of intracranial hemorrhage in uh, 20 patients. And one interesting thing was uh, she saw that 35% of the patient had microembolic signs detected by a transcranial Doppler. So, and those patients were not only patients with AFib. So uh, we have to think that in the acute phase, we might have some thrombogenic uh, effects that are generating some such microemboli. So going to the factors that actually make us think about not anticoagulating the patient, one of those is the presence of a microbleeds in the MRIs. So we know that the more microbleeds that we have, uh, the higher the chances of um, new, a new hemorrhage, though this is a very important um, combined analysis of several studies, of 38 studies with uh, more than 20,000 patients. So in that, what we expected, that if you have more than 10 cerebral microbleeds, you do have a higher chance uh, of intracranial hemorrhage. However, your chances are still higher of having an ischemic stroke. So if you go for the net clinical benefit, we should be thinking about anticoagulating some patients. If we go uh, to evaluate what the data did you have for antiplatelets, so we have the RESTART trial that randomized patients with ICH either to uh, resume uh, antiplatelets if they have an indication to it or not to resume. So it was not a big trial, but the results were very impressive because not only restarting antiplatelets did not increase the chances uh, of uh, further intracranial bleeding, but also it decreased the patients who did receive antiplatelets have less intracranial hemorrhage than the patients who avoid the using of antiplatelets. And we have a long-term follow-up of the restart trial, so that actually continues showing the benefits of restarting uh, antiplatelets uh, versus avoiding it in the long term uh, for uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and for the occurrence of major uh, vascular events, not increasing the risk of uh, bleeding. And uh, this is an important uh, data for us to decide because most of our patients are polyvascular and very frequently they do need antiplatelets. When you go for anticoagulation, so what data we had from registry? So we have three Danish registries uh, with more than 1,700 patients uh, who actually evaluated uh, the effects of restarting anticoagulation in patients with uh, anticoagulation associated bleeding, restarting antiplatelet and versus not giving anything. And you can see clearly that the survival probability in the patients who didn't get any uh, uh, medication or who did receive antiplatelets were lower than the patients who had uh, the anticoagulation resumed. Of course, there are, you know, potential bias because you probably uh, had some reason to restart anticoagulation in some patients and not on others. So that's why uh, we need the, the uh, randomized controlled trials. So we also have data comparing uh, patients using VKA, warfarin, and uh, direct anticoagulants. So it seems that the risk uh, of uh, anticoagulation related bleeding is, is indeed low in the real world with the wax versus VKA. So that's something that we predicted from the pivotal trials. Uh, so it's important for us to know, but as I've, I've, I've uh, demonstrated in the beginning, we still have three to 6% of bleeding in, in patients using uh, factor 10A uh, inhibitors. So summarizing the data, so we have, um, at least four important registries evaluating GI bleeding. Uh, so when the patient was using anticoagulation and showing that uh, when we resume anticoagulation, of course, we do have a decreased rate of thromboemboli. 
we have in some of those registries showing a small increased risk in rebleeding. So there was this uh, data from a uh, little from 2019 showing an, a significant increase in the chances of a new GI bleeding and uh, a decrease in uh, overall mortality in all the registries. So showing that probably the net clinical benefits the net clinical benefits suggest that we should be resuming anticoagulation. And what we have for ICH, so for ICH, we have some uh, data for the use of VKA and some registries evaluating VKA and DOAC, so evaluating patients for one to, to almost three years, showing again a decrease in thromboembolic events, so thromboembolized, um, mostly pulmonary emboli. Uh, one of the registries uh, showing an important increase uh, in recurrent bleeding, uh, and two of them not showing it, and two of the registries showing a decrease in overall mortality. So uh, what we have for now, I mean, based on this, we have some suggestions. This is a suggestion from the European guidelines that when your patient, when your patient has an intracranial bleeding, you should be considering the risk of recurrence. You should definitely assess modified risk factors like hypertension, the use uh, of aspirin that should always be avoided, and then evaluate those risks and benefits and decide if the patient cannot undergo anticoagulation again and consider left uh, atrial occlusion uh, and um, evaluate the risks of um, a new uh, uh, bleeding, of course, and take with all this into account, decide if you should or not uh, resume anticoagulation. So in a practical way, we should be talking about which ischemic disease are we treating? Is it atrial fibrillation or do you have a patient uh, with a mechanical valve prosthesis? That's a completely different patient. Oh, if the patient has atrial fibrillation and the patient had a lower hemorrhage and then you do an MRI and the patient does have more than 10 microbleeds, you probably should be considering not anticoagulation in this patient and maybe occluding the left atrium. If the patient has a non-lumbar hemorrhage, is a hypertensive hemorrhage, you should probably be uh, considering resuming uh, direct anticoagulant. You should be thinking about using uh, the safest one. And the timing for resuming it is still very open. So from five weeks to nine weeks, it seems that the sweet spot uh, seems to be eight weeks, but we're still not quite sure. This is completely different if we're talking about mechanical valve prosthesis. So in such case, of course, we are going to be thinking about resuming anticoagulation, no clinical uh, trial evaluated, you know, such patients. So we generally go from 10 to 15 days if the patient is stable, and of course, and you hope if you have a stable uh, CT scan. So uh, for this, as I've told you, we do need the clinical trials. So we have, you know, several clinical trials evaluating not only the timing, uh, but also restarting or not anticoagulation. Two trials already completed, the SO START with 203 patients and the Apache F, and many trials is still uh, underway to answer these questions for us. So the cell start, that's uh, for us uh, to be, to understand the importance of getting the randomized clinical trial data. Although we have all those registries suggesting the restarted anticoagulation uh, would be important in the cell start trial with 203 patients, we didn't see, it was not non-inferior to, to initiate anticoagulation versus to avoid it. So, and we also have the Apache trial that evaluated 100 patients, uh, some patients resuming anticoagulation with a Pixaban that is usually considered the safest drug versus avoiding it. That also, it's a phase two, of course, did not show any difference in between groups. So that we, we still have a long way to go. That's why we have this cockroach that there is a probably going to be a combination of all such trials. They are trying to answer this question, and we should uh, have more answers soon uh, for us to treat our patients better. If we go to the American Stroke Guideline, what it says, it says that it's a two-way level of dense uh, evidence to reinitiate anticoagulation in patients with higher risk. And it suggests that uh, eight weeks, it's probably uh, the timing suggested by the data that we have now, and it's uh, the most recent guideline that we have. So some takeaway messages. So antithrombotic therapy is the main stain of treatment for patients with ischemic stroke uh, and cerebrovascular disease and a history of thromboembolic events. The clinical decision-making concerning the use of antithrombotic medication once this patient have an ICH remains challenging given the paucity of prospective randomized clinical trials addressing this patient population. Individual patient decision remains by now 
and should be done uh, assessing the risk and the benefits of antithrombotic therapy and data on normal timing to resume anticoagulation in patients uh, in whom uh, we still don't know. It will be remains sparse and we need the data from the randomized clinical trials. Thank you so much for your attention. Here you have the references, some additional resources, and thank you very much. Those are my contacts. Thank you very much, Giselle, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A, but uh, we will leave them for the discussion part after all the lectures have been delivered. So now we continue with Professor Stefan Schwab, Professor of Neurology at the University Hospital Erlangen and President of the German Society for Neurointensive and Emergency Medicine in Germany. His talk is ICH Critical Care Management. Professor Schwab, the floor is yours. Yeah, Anita, thank you for the introduction and the kind invitation. Well, it's my pleasure to talk about the possibilities of critical care for intracerebral hemorrhage. And uh, to start with, it's um, still a disease uh, which is not very good understood. Uh, we know that the mortality as a uh, rule of thumb is around 30% in the first week. And um, unfortunately, it seems to be that the difference in mortality is not improving over the years. Uh, in contrary, it's very similar between 1988 and the early 2000s. And we have, um, well, a lot to do in the treatment of patients with intracranial hemorrhages. We know that there are prognostic factors which we cannot influence, and Gisela already mentioned um, that uh, amyloid angiopathy and other might be a predictor for intracranial hemorrhages. Of course, the location of the intracranial hemorrhage plays an important role, GCS on admission and others. But we have, on the other hand, influenceable uh, risk factors which well compromise of the basic management the question of how can we address hemorrhage growth, hematoma formation growth, edema formation, how do we treat intraventricular uh, um, hemorrhage, and finally hydrocephalus. And to start with, and it's my especially, it's a pleasure to quote here Claude Hempfel, who will subsequently talk about uh, subcoronate hemorrhage. We have scores to predict outcome. And the most important one is the ICH score, which addresses many of the points which I already mentioned, like the GCS, ICH volume, interventricular hemorrhage, inflammatorial origin, and of course, age, which is a major uh, predictor of clinical outcome. Nevertheless, I must say there is more and more data which address also the question of how do patients recover after the initial treatment on the critical care unit. And this is data from CLEAR and MISTI to large randomized trials. Um, uh, MISTI is on, on minimal invasive surgery and CLEAR on intraventricular fibrinolytic therapy in patients with um, intracranial hemorrhages. And the bottom line is, that even after, or especially after the delay of uh, weeks and months, the outcome of those patients is relatively good. And that tells us that we should not prematurely make a prognosis of the individual patient. So I think this is very important that more of than 40% of all patients who had an initial ranking between four and five could be um, seen with a good clinical outcome after 180 days or even after a year of the initial therapy. So I think um, it is very important um, uh, to adequately monitor these patients and especially when it comes to prognosis. So what do we have on evidence now for ICH treatment in the intensive care unit? Of course, we have the basic management of tracheostomy, prophylaxis, deep vein thrombosis, blood pressure management. Uh, I will talk a little bit about interventricular hemorrhage. I will spare ICH surgery, even though we can discuss that later on. Hemorrhage growth is an important uh, point, uh, which Gisela already mentioned. 
And of course, it's, it's the question of how do we treat brain edema following intracranial hemorrhages. So let me start with hemorrhage growth. And um, I think most of you are aware that this is one of the big problems in the management of patients with intracranial hemorrhages, that they tend to have a hemorrhage growth over the first 24 hours. Even though these are old data here from the late 90s, it's still something which we struggle uh, with, uh, how can we prevent hematoma enlargement? And Gisele mentioned that we can do CT imaging, special imaging uh, with the spot sign for detection of patients who are at risk for a subsequent enlargement of their hematoma. Um, and of course, we, we seek for strategies to prevent hematoma expansion. And number one nowadays is, of course, blood pressure reduction. And um, you may ask, what is the optimal blood pressure for those patients with intracranial hemorrhages? And it is very clear that it should be below 140 millimeters mercury systolic. Um, probably it does not need to be lower than that. Uh, but this is the most important factor to prevent hemorrhage growth uh, in our patients. And um, we have several studies on that and a re relatively recent meta-analysis, which nicely shows that plus blood pressure management is one of the most important points here in the management of our patients. The other option would be a hemostatic therapy. And um, something which comes to one's mind is uh, tranexamic acid, which is relatively cheap, easy to handle. And um, we have a lot of studies now addressing tranexamic acid in the management of intracranial hemorrhage patients. And unfortunately, we see that there is a hint that um, there is a slower uh, hematoma expansion or less hematoma expansion with the patients treated with uh, tranexamic acid early on within the first few hours after the onset of symptoms. But finally, it does not translate into a meaningful clinical difference between placebo management and the treatment of tranexamic acid. So uh, the guidelines say you can use tranexamic acid in an early time window below four hours, but um, there is not a convincing body of evidence that it is an effective intervention. And uh, we have ongoing studies on this question of hemostatic therapy. You know the NOVO-7 trials, and uh, here you see the time window for that, the FAST trial, ATTACK, INTERACT, other blood pressure trials pitched to the trilexamic acid, um, which couldn't show any clinical benefit. Now we have ongoing trials which try to interfere even earlier within the first two hours fastest is one of the trials, and we will see whether this will make any difference compared to the relatively older trials of hemostatic therapy. But at the moment, um, there is no hemostatic agent which is uh, widely available and uh, proven effective. Well, we have the issue then, what do we do with those patients who are on oral anticoagulation? And Gisele already mentioned some of the publications. Um, of course, the warfarin-related bleedings uh, have its worst clinical outcome, have the higher hematoma volumes, and are the most uh, of the patients who are in danger of further deterioration. Um, again, we have only limited data. This is one of the small randomized trials which compared uh, four-factor PCC versus fresh frozen plasma. And uh, this trial has to be stopped prematurely, um, but there was clear evidence that uh, four-factor PCC is more effective than fresh frozen plasma to interfere here in those patients with warfarin-related bleedings. This uh, study has already been mentioned from Giorgi Kuramatsu from our department, which again, uh, hints in the direction that we should be as fast as possible here in the interference with blood pressure as well as uh, in the uh, 
um, resumption uh, here with the INR uh, treatment with, with uh, PCC and others. But um, it's hard to say which of the interventions is most effective. It looks very much that the blood pressure control is, is probably the mainstay of everything. And we should um, uh, antagonize the INR as quickly as possible. And with that uh, combination, we will probably see a reduction of the hematoma growth. Saying that it is a, a register um, study, which of course had, it has its flaws and drawbacks, but nevertheless, it's still the best we have that we should interfere here with the blood pressure as early as possible and also in the antagonization of um, elevated INR levels. In NOAC ICH, um, the situation is Pretty similar, we also see a hematoma growth in about 40% of our patients and uh, that uh, comes to the same problem as with uh, uh, what I mean, K antagonists. Those patients tend to have a, a severe clinical outcome and uh, very similar to those patients who are on oral anticoagulation with warfarin. So, uh, there is, luckily enough, uh, in a reversal agent for dabigatran, which you all know, idarosizumab, which seems to be very effective in patients with intracranial hemorrhages. Nevertheless, um, we have no randomized data for treatment with dabigatran related hemorrhages. And Exonet alpha, which is now widely available for the 10A inhibitors, um, again, we have no clear data at the moment uh, where and when to indicate. We in our uh, department made a study where we compared the data from Anexa 4 with our registry data, uh, which I already quoted. And what we see is something which is, I would say, one of the problems of the management of patients with intracranial hemorrhages. We can uh, reduce ICH expansion here with the Andexan and alpha compared to usual care, which is PCC. But this does not translate into a reduced in-hospital mortality. So at the moment, I would say um, we need more randomized data or we need randomized data and Andexanet um, uh, or the uh, company which, which sells Andexanet is um, doing the Anexa I study, which hopefully will show us more results in the next few months or years. Another problem which, which also affects critical care very much is the uh, evaluation of perihemorrhagic edema, which is one of the biggest problems in the management of our, our patients. And we know that the uh, peak of perihemorrhagic edema is very different from the peak of edema formation in, in ischemic stroke. Usually we have the peak around day 10 after the intracranial hemorrhage. And this is one of the typical examples. The way the hemorrhage resolves, the more the edema is obvious here in those patients. And perihemorrhagic edema has a maximum influence on clinical outcome. And as I said, the peak of edema formation can be seen between eight and 10 days after the um, initial impact. So one could think, what else do we have available? And this is a sketch which should tell you that there's a lot of well, pathophysiological uh, mechanisms going on after the in uh, initial intracranial hemorrhage like excitotoxicity, and so on and so on, and it ends up with activation of microglia and so on. So one could think that also an anti-inflammatory approach for those patients could be of benefit. Um, we are still waiting for some smart trials in this question, but um, I'm very hopeful that we will have data in the upcoming years. Conservative treatment of increased intracranial pressure is still something where we have very, very limited data. And um, I will quote a study which addresses 
decompressive surgery, very similar to what we see in, in uh, uh, severe malignant MCA stroke, um, decompressive surgery in those patients with um, uh, a large basal ganglia uh, hemorrhage. Uh, this is the SWITCH trial. Um, unfortunately, they ran out of uh, funding and um, though the study has to be closed now with, I think, 200 patients enrolled, but nevertheless, we will have at least have some data available in the next few months. So in conclusion, perifocal edema is, is of utmost clinical relevance for uh, outcome of our patients. Surgery and hypothermia uh, for a minority of patients with CVICH. We need more pharmaceutical interventions, but at the moment we have no clinical evidence that any of this is really of benefit. And of course, we need more clinical studies which are more or less ongoing. And finally, I would like to stress one very common problem that's the management of intraventricular hemorrhage patients. And we probably you know the clear data, Dan Hanley published that in the Lancet a few years ago, where uh, intraventricular fibrinolysis was applied to those patients. And um, it seemed to be that those patients treated with intraventricular fibrinolysis had a better clinical outcome, not saying that it was statistically significant, but it was a trend towards better cl clinical outcome with um, alteplase, one milligram uh, every 12 hours. And we have meta-analysis on this question. Is it really of benefit? And this meta-analysis really supports intraventricular fibrinolysis. Um, this is further strengthened by a recent study, again, from our group here, Joji Kuramatsu. And um, he compared the data from different study cohorts with uh, the CLEAR cohort and our own group um, cohort. And what you see is that uh, with interventricular fibrinolysis, we have an absolute effect size to achieve a functional outcome uh, after six months of 9.3%. So highly effective for patients with a large interventricular hemorrhage and a relatively small intraparenchymatous part of the hemorrhage. And what is even more important, this seems to be a time-dependent effect. So the treatment within the first 48 hours um, led to the best clinical outcome in those patients treated with intraventricular fibrinolysis. And knowing all that, um, it could well be that we set up a new trial uh, which addresses uh, this group in the early time window of 48 hours. So summing up is, um, I think we have a variety of new therapeutic options in our patients uh, treated on the ICU. That is uh, strict blood pressure management, perhaps in the future new ICP therapies. Uh, minimal invasive hematoma evacuation is an option. I didn't mention that today, but it's still under discussion. Intraventricular fibrinolysis, secondary prevention and anticoagulation related ICH, uh, Gisela mentioned that. And I think hemostatic intervention is something which is still under debate. We wait for new trials and we will see whether this is really one of the possibilities to further improve clinical outcome. On the other hand, we need more smaller trials on specific questions like lumbar drainage, respiratory therapies and others. And my, my take home message for you is there's no reason for a nihilistic approach to ICH patients. We have more and more ways to treat those patients. And especially on a neuro ICU, um, I think most of or all of those patients should be treated in a dedicated setting. Um, and this is to the benefit of our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, for this extraordinary lecture. And uh, we have also some questions here in the Q&A, but we will uh, answer them later. And we move on to our third talk today that will be delivered by Professor Claude Hemphill, Professor of Neurology at the U 
the CSF Weill Institute for Neurosciences and Director of Neurocritical Care in Zuckerberg, San Francisco, United States. And his talk is Management of Subarachnoidal Hemorrhage. Professor Hemphill, please, you may deliver your lecture. Thank you very much, Anita. And uh, it's great to be here with you all. Um, I am going to apologize that I have a little bit of a cold. And so I appreciate everybody's accommodation if I go on mute to cough. But I think uh, it's, it's uh, nice to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and remind us uh, of what, uh, what does a patient like this look like? So you typical case, 35 year old man, sudden onset of worst headache of his life 45 minutes ago, vomiting, confused, lethargic, high blood pressure. And here's the CAT scan. And this shows a few subarachnoid hemorrhage. And you can see the tips of the temporal, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the temporal tips of the lateral ventricles are enlarged. So there's early hydrocephalus. So the question is, what are the management principles for aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is what we're talking about here. So first is going to be diagnosis of SAH and aneurysm and patient classification, but then managing the complications. And the complications are pretty straightforward to predict. It's pretty much rebleeding hydrocephalus and delayed cerebral ischemia. We used to say rebleeding hydrocephalus vasospasm, but we're really going to we're really going to focus and call it DCI, which is the really the, the, the sequela perhaps of vasospasm. So rebleeding hydrocephalus vasospasm and everything else. Rebleeding hydrocephalus DCI, everything else. So first is the diagnosis and CT scan is usually uh, adequate. Uh, usually we don't have to get an MRI scan, but the use of CT angiography really um, uh, ideally should be routine in these patients. Many times a, uh, an angiogram is needed, and certainly, as we'll talk about in a little bit, if a, if a patient is uh, going to be treated endovascularly to uh, occlude the aneurysm, they, they get an angiogram. But a CTA can be really useful uh, uh, early on in order to help stage the patient and plan. And here's an example of a patient with uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And if you look at the CT scan, you can sort of see an area that's dark that maybe sort of looks like an aneurysm, but you get the CTA over here and you see obviously there's the aneurysm uh, right there, anterior communicating artery, I believe. So grading scales for subarachnoid hemorrhage are really uh, important and they're not so much important as with any grading scale. Uh, it's not so much important to try to predict outcome, but really to classify and stratify how sick the patient is. Two main scales, the Hunt S scale or the WFNS scale. You can use whatever you choose. Um, uh, I think the Hunt Hess tends to be used a little more in the US, WFNS uh, in other parts of the world. But um, it's important to be able to classify our patient. Once again, not to try to predict outcome, but help stratify. Uh, and because it's going to help one uh, sort of put this patient in, in the bin of what to expect in terms of potential outcome, but also complications that are going to occur in the next uh, uh, days to weeks. So here's a graph, once again, going back to that neurologic complications and listing the timing of these. So if we go to our uh, rebleeding um, vasospasm or delayed cerebral ischemia and uh, hydrocephalus, you see that the rebleeding is the big actor at the beginning. Certainly, hydrocephalus uh, can occur early. Hyponatremia is one of the other complications, but but uh, and then um, the delayed cerebral ischemia is, by its very nature, delayed. That's usually not going to be happening on day one. That's usually happening several days into it. So there's this naturally occurring window to try to treat the patient's aneurysm that's ruptured perhaps treat the hydrocephalus as well, and anticipate how delayed cerebral scheme is gonna be managed. So why is, uh, why is it su such a priority to treat an aneurysm after it's ruptured? Well, because the risk of re-rupture is high. The risk of re-rupture is high um, <coughs> in the first day, but it continues. So that if an aneurysm isn't treated first two weeks, there's a 20 to 25% risk of re-bleeding, and the, and the mortality of re-bleed is about 50%. So if at all possible, 
Job number one is to secure the ruptured aneurysm. This is going to eliminate early re-rupture risk and it's going to allow for aggressive treatment of vasospasm and delayed cerebral ischemia. So this is really a key component. That's always the first question that we ask uh, uh, is how are we going to uh, how are we going to get this aneurysm treated? Now there are some medical treatments for uh, aneurysmal rupture. Should we just uh, lower the blood pressure? Well, uh, you know, there's consensus around, you know, lowering very high blood pressure in someone who's had aneurysmal rupture, but the exact target is unclear. Uh, American Heart Association guidelines, existing ones from 2012, suggest lowering it to less than 160 uh, systolic. Um, <clears throat> Antifibrinolytic uh, medications, there used to be a lot of enthusiasm for this. The idea that you could give a medication that medically would keep the, uh, uh, would, would, such as uh, aminocaproic acid or, or TXA, and that would keep the aneurysm from erupturing. But it turns out when this was studied in a recent phase three trial called ULTRA, there was no difference in outcome. So this is really not a winning strategy. This is not a primary strategy. There are occasionally rare situations in which someone has a very complex aneurysm that can't be treated for a long time and we consider this, but really this is not our strategy. Uh, the strategy is early definitive endovascular coiling or surgical clipping. And so these are the two main options, endovascular coiling or surgical clipping. And used to be, maybe there still is a lot of controversy when whether an aneurysm should be clipped or coiled. I think there's a lot less controversy. Partly may be that uh, different providers have been trained in these various techniques. But when this was looked at in the ISAT trial and long, long-term follow-up was followed, it basically came that, that although initially coiling favored, uh, was favored over clipping, the long, long-term follow-up, they basically are about the same. So the point here is get the aneurysm treated. Get the aneurysm treated. Now, when the, uh, I mentioned the American Heart Association guidelines, they mention multidisciplinary decision making based on the patient and the aneurysm. And the European Stroke Organization guidelines also note that multidisciplinary team, neurosurgery, neuroradiology, <coughs> neurology, neurocritical care, this is really key. This is really key. Uh, and in fact, there probably are characteristics that would favor uh, a clipping of an aneurysm, such as middle cerebral artery. Uh, uh, location wide aneurysm neck and there are factors that would favor coiling of an aneurysm such as posterior location uh, uh, small aneurysm neck but the point here is a multidisciplinary team that does this routinely is really key so as we'll mention sort of towards the end of the talk uh, one of the key aspects here is having patients treated in or transferred to a center that does this all the time now there are continued advances in endovascular aneurysm treatment and stent assisted coiling, new coil materials, flow diverting stents. So this is a rapidly, rapidly changing uh, area and evolving area. What about hydrocephalus? Very, very common. Treated with an external ventricular drain. Most patients who are Hunt S3 or WFNS2 should get an EVD. Uh, is it better to do a rapid EVD wean or do a slow EVD wean? No randomized trials, but a recent study that was an observational study suggested that a rapid EVD wean reduces length of ICU stay and need for VP shunt. So what about DCI? Well, most of the work previously really linked vasospasm, which is arterial narrowing on an imaging study. So vasospasm, it's an imaging finding on angiography, CTA, TCD. It tends to happen at three to 14 days post bleed linked that with DCI, neurologic deterioration presumed related to ischemia lasting more than an hour. Now, one of the things that's very interesting in the evolution of this is uh, maybe a move away from the pure vasospasm theory of DCI, and there may be other aspects related to inflammation or um, uh, uh, cortical spreading depolarization, cortical spreading depolarization. But really, DCI is a major determinant of SAH outcome. It's the major secondary complication. So monitoring prevention and treatment is key. And the recommendations are currently using nimodipine, which was studied in randomized trials, now done, completed more than 30 years ago. Maintaining euvolemia, 
prophylactic hyperlamia is not favored, and considering hypertensive therapy if a patient appears to be having secondary ischemia. And the use of imaging techniques such as TCD or CT angiography and CT perfusion may be very, very useful. And then withdrawal therapy uh, if, uh, if uh, we're out of the DCI window. So here's an example of a patient who's having vasospasm and the transcranial Doppler uh, correlates with the angiogram that shows a very high grade um, uh, middle cerebral artery stenosis. And here a mean velocity is 227 uh, centimeters per second, which is very, very high. The normal is around 50. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a case example of where we used advanced neuromonitoring for uh, treating a patient who had delayed cerebral ischemia. Now, some of you may not use these particular uh, advanced techniques and that's okay. But I think the point of this is it provides a window into the underlying pathophysiology and it's there whether we're monitoring it or not. So in order to figure out how to target treatment, especially in the poor grade SAH patient, we probably need additional tools besides just the neurologic examination and a transcranial Doppler ultrasound. This was a 51 year old woman who had a uh, seven days after a WFNS grade 5 SAH, and we had a brain tissue oxygen monitor in the right middle cerebral artery region, and it dropped from normal at 21 to uh, 4 millimeters of mercury. Now, she had no change in her neurologic examination, but frankly, her neurologic examination was so impaired that I don't think we could really tell a meaningful difference that would correlate with uh, uh, a change in her perfusion. But we did get a CT perfusion, and it showed on that right side slowed mean transit time. So we had a brain tissue oxygen that correlated with the CT perfusion, showing impaired perfusion. Did an angiogram, and here it shows dramatic vasospasm of the right middle cerebral artery. So she underwent soft balloon angioplasty of the middle cerebral artery, and you can see a dramatic improvement in the caliber of the middle cerebral artery, and concurrent with this, her brain tissue oxygen went back up. So that's the physiological principle. This has not been tested in randomized trials, but in this particular patient, this was what was going on. Hyponatremia, extremely common. We're gonna define that as less than uh, 130 for a serum sodium. One of the key concepts here is, you know, it could be cerebral salt wasting, it could be SIADH. Bottom line is don't fluid restrict these patients. That can promote DCI, delayed cerebral ischemia. We're going to target euvolemia and give them salt. Salt tablets or infusions of 2 or 3% sodium chloride. We just need to target a normal sodium level. You can use hydrocortisone or fluidocortisone, but just be patient. This will resolve over time, but don't fluid restrict these patients. And then I mentioned the idea of, of aggressive uh, hypervolemia sort of prophylactically. And that's really not recommended because of increase in cardiopulmonary complications. <clears throat> now, I'm going to conclude by commenting on high volume centers. And it's interesting because I think we've seen over and over again studies that have shown that high volume centers are associated with improved outcome in the management of aneurysmal subarachnoid right hemorrhage patients. Well, what's a high volume? Is it 20, like you have to get for a Joint Commission Comprehensive Stroke Certification in the US? Is it 35? Is it 60? Well, it's interesting. This UK study <coughs> found there was no cutoff. Here, the more you do, if you do 100 subarachnoid right hemorrhage patients a year, that's better than 50. But 200 is better than 150, and 250 is better than 100. This makes a lot of sense. So there's not really a cutoff where you can say, oh, we treat 20 or 25. We are a high volume center. The more you do, the better, better you are at it. And that's because this is a complex disease that requires multidisciplinary care for treating aneurysms, but also in the ICU. So additional considerations, prophylactic anticonvulsants probably not routinely needed. Hypertensive therapy is probably safe with an unruptured aneurysm because many patients, about 20% may have concurrent unruptured aneurysms. And we always want to think about DVT prophylaxis and attention to detail of avoiding fever, hyperglycemia, and get early feeding in. So take home messages, main issues, rebleeding, hydrocephalus, DCI. Job number one, get that aneurysm treated. Coiling probably preferred if it's amenable to both, may need to get to a higher volume center. Day three to 14 is vasospasm watch. 
the patients need to be in a place where that can be done, an ICU or a stroke unit, so that you can execute on your plan for hypertensive therapy or increased volume resuscitation or angiography when that happens and not waiting for infarction to occur. Rapid EVD wean should generally be attempted in most cases. Cardiopulmonary complications are common. Patients may have stunned myocardium and they may require presser support or uh, inotropic support, but these are usually only lasting a few days. And then hyponatremia is common. Treat with salt and be patient. So thank you very much. And I am happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hemphill, for this outstanding lecture. And now we move to our discussion part. We still have several minutes to answer some of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A section. So the first question is, I suppose this is for uh, Professor Silva, uh, would you recommend triple therapy for a patient with atrial fibrillation and ischemic stroke and recently placed DEC, uh, but also uh, all speakers are welcome to comment on this question. Thanks, Anita. That's actually a very important question because when we are dealing with drug eluting uh, stents, we don't have many options, yeah. For at least one month, the patients are going to have to receive a uh, double antiplatelet. And if the patient has uh, AFib, so we'll probably need anticoagulation as well. Of course, it will depend on the size of the stroke. But I mean, if you don't keep the dual antiplatelet, the patient can die due to the stent thrombosis. So you're gonna have to, to go for dual antiplatelet and, and at least for one month. Then we have, you know, basically based on the Augustus trial, a lot of data showing that after one month, probably keeping um, a Pixaban and uh, Plavix is, is safe. And you don't need to be to to uh, to keep triple antiplate triple uh, uh, therapy for a long time, but at least for the first month, you're probably going to have to keep the the three. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then we have uh, another question. Uh, so, what numbers do you quote patients and their families for a twenty to thirty cc putaminal ICH and uh, a B for a 30 cc lower ICH, both related to hypertension. I think this is a question addressed for Professor Schwab. It was posted during your, your lecture, if you would like to answer. Well, what numbers do you quote uh, that what numbers, addresses yes. to the question of clinical outcome or, or yes. to get that right? I mean, yeah. those patients with a relatively small putaminal hemorrhage uh, can have a decent outcome. As I mentioned, and this is quoting the, the randomized uh, or the, the subsequent follow-up of randomized patients, uh, which can lead to a good clinical outcome between 40 and 50% of those patients. So I think um, they have a relatively good chance for recovery. And 30cc is the lower edge of uh, where I see that patients can have a, a good clinical outcome. So that's my number. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question for Professor Giselle. Uh, what is uh, the optimal timing for restarting DOACs after ICH? Yeah, that's a $1 million question, yeah, Anita. So as you see, we have some data from registries uh, saying that, yeah, we should be thinking about reinitiating, resuming anticoagulation. The randomized control trials completed up to now, the SOSTART and the Apache F, we're not so clear about it. So we definitely need more data. So for a while, we have actually to wait, you know, the risks and benefits. And the sweet spot seems to be around seven to eight weeks. But of course, it will depend on the risk of thrombosis. So if you have a mechanical valve, you're probably going to do it, you know, earlier, around two weeks. If it is AFib, no thrombos in the left atrium, you probably can wait a little more. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is... Uh... I suppose this is also for Professor Schwab. Uh, 
uh, in a scale from one lowest to 10 highest, how would you rate your level of enthusiasm to use a reverse, reversing agency, for example, adexanate for an ICH of 25 cc? Okay, well, it's a difficult question. My level of enthusiasm, uh, well, it, I think at the moment it's between five and six, I would say, I mean, we have no clear evidence that this is really the treatment of choice. When you would ask for, for dabigatran and idorosizumab, my level would be a little bit higher. But at the moment, I'm still reluctant in, in using um, andexan at alpha on a, on a wide scale. Saying that I know that uh, we don't have any other well, clear evidence for, for, for PCC or others. So, but um, I, I would still like to see the results of index and, and uh, an XRI and others. Okay. And our next question is, uh, how would you treat a 76 year old with an acute ischemic stroke with NHSS of 10, who is known to have 15 to 20 micro hemorrhages, 50, 50 superficial and deep, and the options are, would that be IV thrombolysis alone, EVT alone, combined IVT and EVT, or no acute treatment, and uh, the patient is with Smith M2 occlusion, independent at the baseline. I suppose this is also a question for you, Professor Schwab. Must... I must say I uh, would not uh, look too much on, on the question of um, macro hemorrhages in those patients. And usually we do not know either because uh, our, our initial workup is a, a non-contrast CT. So I would always go for thrombolytic therapy and in those patients with large vessel occlusion uh, thrombectomy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question for uh, Professor Hemphill. Uh, oh, you are typing the. You may answer live, Professor Hemphill, if you are, if you would like to. to answer. I don't even know if we had uh, had enough time. I think the question was, if someone has a re rupture, do you restart the nimodipine clock? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I I tend to, although. Um, uh, you know, so if somebody has a, uh, if we start no motopine on day one and they re-rupture on day three uh, for, you know, because we hadn't got the aneurysm treated, uh, I, I restart the 21-day nimodipine clock. Although I would say, I think that if someone's no longer having vasospasm, I think those days 17, 18, 20, probably those last few days of nimodipine don't make that much of a difference. Okay, thank you. And there is another question for you. Do you use the ganglion block for DCI prevention? Not, uh, that is not something that we're, we're using. Okay, okay. So, um, well, um, would anyone uh, like to add to anything? Uh, because we are coming to an end of our webinar of the speakers, some final notes. If not, then I would like to thank all our extraordinary speakers today for delivering excellent and outstanding lectures and uh, answering all these interesting questions from our audience. And now uh, we get back to Laura. I would like to ask you, Laura, to, to uh, close this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Anita. Indeed, wonderful discussions, great presentations and questions. Thank you, everyone, for your warm participation in today's webinar. As mentioned, a recorded version will be shared with you and uploaded on the WSA site. In the meanwhile, you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn for upcoming educational activities, and visit our WSA site. We have asked you at the beginning, please complete the survey, which will pop up on your screens at the end of the webinar. Our next webinar is planned for the 18th of May, Comprehensive Stroke Care. So we do hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.